Before I jump into today's recording, I wanted to give you an update on the trauma intensive that went down last weekend. You guys, it was amazing. Uh, I learned so much. I know that some of you have wondered what that was like. So I, I just want to give you a little taste of what we did there and then tell you what I learned. We had it at a beautiful Airbnb in Central Florida. It included all the homemade meals, lodging, linens, the teaching, um, group processing sessions, group therapy. Every client who came got two and a half sessions of one-on-one therapy. We gave everyone a notebook filled with resources. There was creative processing. We had art supplies out. We had worship times. We had a bonfire with s'mores. We had a little bit of free time. We had biblical teaching. There was so much offered and so many beautiful experiences. So I'm just going to summarize real quick what I came away with. Honestly, I was in awe of these women, these brave women who came to work through some really hard things. They were honest, they were vulnerable, they were open to learning and growing and doing the work of healing. They were hungry for God's word. They were kind and encouraging. One of the things I learned was just the power of community, the power of empathetically holding one another's stories. I think what I loved most about the intensive was having therapists there who could help with some really practical, hands-on techniques. And then combining that with the biblical truth and the biblical teaching and times of worship, to me it was so beautiful. Because I think sometimes we put therapy on one end of the spectrum and Bible teaching on the other end. And this intensive was a true integration of God's word and God's principles using the minds and the bodies that he has given us. Another thing I realized, and this was more of a personal takeaway for me, was just how much women need to know the stories of women in scripture. Like they need to know that God loves them, that they do not need to live in shame, that they don't have to carry these things alone. And it just reinforced in in my heart and kind of confirmed the passion that God has given me to help women understand his heart toward the broken, the wounded, the violated, the betrayed. Because there's so many women out there who are walking through really hard things. And there's so many women in scripture who have walked that road before us. And there's so much that we can learn from them. As a follow-up to the intensive, I'm going to be going through my Bible study with the women who were at the intensive. And that gave me an idea that there might be some of you listening who would love to go through that study. And maybe you don't have a group of friends or you're not part of a church that wants to go through that study together. So so I'm going to do that with this group through early November. And then in January, I'm going to offer to go through Graced with some of you. If that is something you're interested in, you can shoot me an email and just say, I would love to be a part of going through Graced with you. I've gone through it with one group already, and it has just been an honor to see God take his word and use it to bring comfort, peace, healing, growth. It's not the end all be all. I'm not saying it's going to solve all your problems, but I am saying it's going to give you a glimpse of God's heart toward you. And that is something every one of us can use. Okay, now onto the show. Hi friend, you're listening to Find Hope Here. I'm your host, Teresa Whiting, author, speaker, ministry leader, friend, and fellow struggler. This is a podcast about the messy, complicated, painful parts of life, but also the beautiful, joy-filled hope that Jesus promises. Each week, we dig deep into God's Word together and talk about how His truth impacts our everyday lives. I'm not going to ask you to sit with me and have coffee because I seem to have my best conversations while I'm just doing life. So I'd love to hang out with you as you walk or fold laundry or drive to work. 
you're invited to join me in pursuing the hope God promises. No matter where you are or where you've been, I pray you always find hope here. Let's jump in to today's episode. When my kids were little, we used to read this book by Max Lucado called You Are Special. It's a story about a village of wooden people called Wemix, and they would go around all day, every day, giving each other stars and dots based on how they performed, what they looked like, or how talented they were. Punchinello sees all the Wemix with stars, but he is covered with dots. Then he meets a Wemmick who's unlike all the others. She doesn't have stars or dots. She's just wooden. They have a conversation, and she tells Punchinello about Eli, the woodcarver, the one who made all the wooden people. After a visit to Eli, Punchinello begins to realize that his worth is not based on the marks other people give him, but on his inherent value as one created by the woodcarver. It's a beautiful story about identity and value and God's love for us and the power of believing that love. But also it's a story about how our world works. The world of the Wemix is the world that you and I live in. We live in a world driven by the desire to be seen and celebrated. We all want to be epic. We want to be extraordinary. We're obsessed with giving each other stars and dots. This story plays out day after day in the world of social media, especially the the likes, the hearts, the posts, the reposts. That's our version of stars and dots. But even before social media came to be, this was something that we all struggled with and we all lived with. Have you ever watched a TikTok video? I'm guessing the answer would be yes. Last December, my son Caleb's best friend came to visit in Florida. And on the way home back to Cleveland, his flight got canceled. So he met a few people in line in the airport and they rented a car together and drove back to Cleveland. Well, one of the girls in the car was a TikToker and she was taking videos of their trip. And it went viral. It got millions of views and it was really fun to watch. And actually, I think it might be the only TikTok I've ever watched. But if you look up like four strangers on a road trip or four strangers at Christmas time or something like that, you will see like hundreds and hundreds. They, they got picked up by news channels. Um, it was everywhere. And I think about that and I think, look at all the stars they got. They had their moment of fame, and then it was over. And the next big thing came along, and everybody probably forgot about that story. But so much more important than that moment is how those four people live their everyday lives, how they live the small moments of their lives that nobody's watching, that nobody's posting. Our world tells us we need to be epic. We need to go viral. We need to be important. We need to make a mark on the world. It tells you you need to do certain things and be certain things to be valuable. And if you don't, you're just small and unimportant. Our world tries to convince us that our value lies in how many stars we have. But when we study scripture, it becomes so clear that God delights in using ordinary people. If you don't mind, I'm going to detour for just a second and get on one of my soap boxes. See, we live in this world that is driven by big tech. Since the advent of the iPhone and social media and all the things that are being thrown at us every single day, we have so much pressure on us, not just to be important, but to be connected, right? To be on these platforms. But we have been an experiment. All that stuff, it's not designed just by people who are trying to make our lives better. Those things are designed by scientists, brain scientists, and their goal is to addict us and consume us so they can get more of our time and our money. It's really interesting because 
the data is just finally starting to roll in about the effects that all of these technological advances have had on our lives. And it's kind of scary because they can see that our brains are changing. Like the literal brain structure of the people who are spending a lot of time on social media or on our computers or on technology, probably mine too, our brains are actually changing. Our capacity to think deeply is diminishing. Our ability to relate to one another as humans is diminishing Empathy has decreased. There are some really good things that technology has done, but what it has done to the human soul and the human mind, I really feel like we need to approach with caution and proceed with caution. All right, I'm getting off my soapbox because that's not really what I wanted to talk about today. I want to talk about the story of Ruth and Naomi. And we are now coming to the end of our story. We have seen them, these women that were foreigners, that were social outcasts, really they were zeros. They they would have had no stars and lots of dots. They really didn't have much going for them. And yet they were warriors. They were so brave and courageous. We've seen them looking out for each other, loving each other. And we've seen them being rescued and redeemed, taken under God's wing. We've seen Boaz caring for them and helping provide for them. In so many ways, Ruth and Naomi are just like you and me. Their lives were marked by common struggles between them. They faced famine, widowhood, infertility, poverty. They both experienced being strangers in a foreign land. You know, that feeling of being out of place, like I'm not home here. I don't really belong. They were nobody special. Nobody would have been paying attention to them or making videos about them on TikTok. Can you relate to feeling like that? Like, I'm nobody. I'm nothing special. But here's the thing. They weren't trying to be heroes. They were just going about their regular lives. They were working and living and eating and talking with their neighbors and loving each other. Their lives were so ordinary. Naomi was an elderly widow who wasn't afraid to speak honestly about her disappointment with God, her struggles, and yet she cared for Ruth. She was looking out for Ruth. Ruth lived a simple, sacrificial life, taking care of her mother-in-law, working hard to put food on the table. Ruth had her back bent low and dirt under her nails. She was living in gratitude and humility. So let's review a little bit about their story, what we've heard the past several weeks. It started out with a lot of bad news. It started out, the first five verses of the book of Ruth are really tragic. It's the story of Naomi losing everything. And this is how she summarized it. She said, God has dealt bitterly with me. Basically, she's like, God has ruined my life. And they returned to Bethlehem and Ruth happened to come to Boaz's field, who showed great kindness and generosity to her and to Naomi. And Naomi realized, oh, maybe God hasn't abandoned us after all. Maybe he's still kind. He's still good. And then we see Boaz step up as a kinsman redeemer or a a family redeemer. And he buys them out of poverty at a great cost to himself. And now we're coming to the end of their story. And we're in Ruth chapter four. I'm going to read verses 13 to 15. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. If you remember back in chapter one, which was four episodes ago, we talked about that key word, return. It was the Hebrew word shub. 
And here is something so interesting. That word shows up again at the end of the book. At the beginning of the book, it was like, return, go back, go back. God has returned me empty. And now we learn that that word return also means restore. Remember in Ruth 121, when Naomi said, I went away full, but the Lord has returned me empty. Think about that. She came back with Ruth, the one who would give birth to the restorer of her life. And I think it's so cool how God, even, you know, in literature, that word comes full circle. She went from return, return, return to God has restored. And we got to watch it all unfold. I'm going to read verse 15 again. It says, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Remember, this is a culture of patriarchy. How could these women say Ruth is better than seven sons, a daughter-in-law better than sons and seven, like seven is the number of perfection in scripture. When you see the number seven, it means like complete. It's, it's, doesn't get any better than that. And seven sons, I mean, we know how much they valued sons. What could be better than seven sons? Ruth, Ruth was better because she cared for and loved Naomi. She was a warrior fighting by her side. She not only battled for Naomi's line, she produced an heir, they think, to carry on Elimelech's lineage. Wow, say that, Elimelech's lineage. That's a tough one. Verse 16. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Interesting that they say Naomi has a son. Remember, we talked about the fact that the book of Ruth is really Naomi's story. It starts with Naomi, it ends with Naomi. And we see the plot coming full circle as well. Does God know or care about his daughters? Does he love them? And we have seen over and over the answer to that question is yes. God has demonstrated his love, his concern, his compassion for these two women who the world would have been ignoring. And Ruth finishes with this. This is chapter four, verse 18. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. Sometimes we come across names or lists of names in scripture. Like if we're reading through Chronicles or Numbers and we're like, oh my goodness, these lists. But this lineup of names right here is amazing. Not because these people have lots of stars, but it's amazing because we see that God chooses people with lots of dots, the people that are the nothings, the people that have wounds and scars and baggage, the people that nobody in the world would notice or put up on a pedestal. And he says, these are my people. These are the ones I'm coming through and for. You know, I love to study women in the Bible. And we know from Matthew who some of the women were in this lineup. It talks about Perez. Well, Perez's mother was Tamar, the one who was used and abused. She was a foreigner, a Canaanite. Then we see Boaz. We know that Boaz's mom was Rahab. May have been his grandmother, his great-grandmother. Rahab was a prostitute from Jericho. She was a broken woman. And yet we saw how God rescued her back in the episode about Rahab. Then we see Obed whose mother was Ruth, this foreigner, a woman who dealt with barrenness, a woman who wasn't one who belonged. And then we see David, who married Bathsheba, who suffered all kinds of pain and loss. And if you want to know more about these women, 
You can order my Bible study, Graced, How God Redeems and Restores the Broken, because Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba are all featured, all women that experience sexual brokenness. And God said, yes, these are the ones that I'm building my family through. Ruth was part of the line of people who brought Jesus into the world. They had no idea when she laid her son in Naomi's lap that they were holding the great-grandfather of King David. Nor did they realize in that same little town of Bethlehem that the baby born to save the world would be a direct descendant of Ruth herself. How would they know the role they were playing in God's story? They wouldn't. And maybe you feel like you're nothing special or you're unqualified or your life is so ordinary or you have too many dots and not enough stars. Well, if that's the case, you are exactly the woman that God is looking for. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. I don't have a life verse, but if I did, it would probably be this one. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not, literally the nothings, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God has an important role for you to play. You matter. Your life matters. You're a friend, a daughter. Maybe you're a sister or a mom. You're a coworker. I want to encourage you to live the life that is right in front of you. You don't have to be epic. The world is going to hold things in front of you. TikTok, Instagram, TV, movies, all of it. It says, this is what matters. But I'm telling you, if you chase what the world offers, you're going to end up anxious, sad, disillusioned, and exhausted. It will never fill your soul. You'll never have enough stars because you know what the world says? You just need one more. You just need one more. You just need one more. And I want to beg you, don't buy into the cultural competition. Your house doesn't need to look like a Pinterest post. Your life doesn't need to be Instagram worthy. Enjoy the moments of the life you have. And can I say this? Put your stupid phone down. I also want to challenge you to think about this. Maybe you don't need to post the sacred moments of your life. When my kids were little, we didn't have cell phones. I didn't have a camera in my back pocket. And at my baby shower, a friend gave me this beautiful piece of advice. And I still try to do it occasionally. She said, Teresa, when you're having a moment with one of your kids, take a picture with your mind. Like, look at what is in front of you. Take it in. Sear the image into your memory. And one of those images I have, and it's so beautiful. I remember so specifically, there was one night I was nursing my newborn daughter and she was wrapped in a little yellow and white checked blanket and she had all this dark hair. And I remember thinking, I don't want to forget this. And so I took a picture with my mind and you know what? I didn't miss the moment. I can still go back to it today. My guess is if I had had a cell phone and I had snapped a photo, that memory would be gone. It wouldn't even be in my mind. So friends, I want to encourage you to pay attention to the life you actually have. Not the fairy tale you dream of. Love the people in front of you. Work hard. Follow Jesus. Be kind. You are an azer. You're a warrior for God's kingdom. Think about this. Ruth and Naomi couldn't see generations ahead. They had no idea we would be reading their story, talking about them on this podcast. They would have had no idea how God 
was using their ordinary lives to build his kingdom. And I am confident that the same God is working in the details of our ordinary lives. Maybe we don't need to be seen and known by hundreds of people. Maybe we don't need to blue check mark by our name on Instagram or millions of views on TikTok. Maybe God is working out his plans and purposes in and through us as we work and live and pray in our own little corner of the world. And maybe all of life, the exciting and the boring, the beautiful and the broken, the joy and the pain, the good and the bad, all woven together on the battlefield of life is just what God has planned for us. So how is God going to use your ordinary life? I hope that listening to the story of Ruth and Naomi and kind of digging into who they were and what God has done in their lives and how he has used them is an encouragement to you. It is to me. I love studying women in scripture. I love digging into their stories and seeing God's work in the midst of people who were just like us. If you enjoy that, I want to encourage you to get a copy of Graced, How God Redeems and Restores the Broken. It's a Bible study about six women in scripture that God redeemed and restored from sexual brokenness. And even if that's not your story, there are themes in this study that apply to every woman. We are going to continue our series entitled Held. I'm super excited because we have some amazing guests coming up. I have Lisa Epelo coming on who tells the story of God holding her when she lost her husband and was left a single mom of seven children. I have Nikki Hardy coming on who is a cancer, not just a survivor, but a thriver. I have Beth Clays coming on who talks about how God's word speaks to our pain and suffering. So friend, I hope you're enjoying this season and this series entitled Held. And I hope that even more than that, that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are held in the mighty arms of our great God. Thanks for hanging out with me today on Find Hope Here. To find anything I mentioned on the episode, go to teresawhiting.com slash listen. That's where you can find all the show notes. And remember to hit that subscribe button. If you want to go the extra mile and leave a review, that would be amazing. And it would mean so much to me. I'd like to leave you with this prayer from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope 